Beautiful day, but uh, taking time to to come here, Professor Troy uh, will be speaking about the book Leading from the Center, Why Moderates Make the Best Presidents. Um, my name is Frank Mitchke. I'm the Deputy Director of the Next Social Contract Initiative here at New America. I'll be talking a little bit about that in a few minutes about the Next Social Contract Initiative. Um, New America in general was founded on this uh, concept of the radical center. Um, radical in the sense that uh, we need big ideas to confront uh, important issues in the center in that uh, we're looking for pragmatic solutions. And I think that's a lot of what uh, Professor Troy is talking about in this book. Uh, and, you know, it's specifically, it's not about splitting differences, but about finding ways to solve big issues um, in a new, new fashion. Um, striving for the center is not easy. Uh, we know that. Uh, many politicians who have done so and uh, are no longer in the business know that. Uh, so whether you're a think tank or a politician, uh, being bipartisan, being postpartisan, being nonpartisan, or my favorite, being all partisan, which I saw for the first time recently, is is a challenge. Uh, Jim Hightower, who's a commentator for, on the left, has said uh, the title of his book was that "There's nothing in the middle of the road but yellow stripes and dead armadillos." So uh, politics is about passion and identity, and sometimes it's hard to translate uh, moderation to that. Uh, you know, talk shows, uh, there's really no seat on, uh, the, in the no spin zone for a moderate. Uh, it's about right and wrong, it's about uh, right versus left, and uh, so that makes it difficult. But Professor Troy is dogged in all of his writing about elevating the language around moderation, which I think is an important first step uh, to gaining acceptance and gaining uh, power for, for moderates. Um, on his blog, he calls for a golden middle that is strong, resonant, constructive, and idealistic. Passionate moderate may sound oxymoronic, sort of like a violent pacifist, but not according to Professor Troy. You know, Barry Goldwater famously said that moderation in pursuit of justice is not a virtue. I think the professor would suggest that moderation in the pursuit of justice or any other political accomplishment is a necessity. And I think it's important to note that the presidents he talks about in this book are nobody's ideas of wimps. Uh, Lincoln, TR, FDR, Reagan, they're all very strong presidents, presidents with strong legacies uh, of, of somewhat revolutionary policies. But they got there in a moderate fashion. Uh, the professor talks quite a bit about muscular moderation and the use of nationalism by these folks. And he uses the term nationalism and patriotism um, in a non-pejorative sense, which is uh, both nice to see and uh, refreshing. Uh, and, and conversely, those presidents such as uh, Bill Clinton, who uh, most folks, I think, think of as a moderate, uh, the book talks about his spineless centrism. And, uh, and in those presidents who are rigid and as a result uh, thought of as failures or potential failures in the case of uh, President Bush, uh, he excoriates them for their conviction uh, with a lack of, of moderation. So uh, he sees very much the importance of flexibility and of core principles uh, together in an administration. The uh, presidency rates as failures were either too rigid or they were lacking in core beliefs. And I think uh, he'll expound on those as, as he speaks. Uh, before I formally introduce Professor Troy, I wanted to make a brief mention of the next social contract initiative. Um, this is our attempt at New America to bring together a number of different domestic policy issues and talk about the issues that uh, the campaigns are talking about currently in a, in a new, uh, with a new perspective. Senator McCain has said that the policies and institutions of America have failed because they were designed for what he called mid-20th century thinking. And uh, Senator Obama, in Audacity of Hope, said that modernizing and rebuilding the social contract had to be a priority for the society. Um, and that's exactly what we're trying to do with the next social contract initiative. Um, the issues, the goals of the initiative are economic opportunity and economic security, and we stress that these are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they're entirely in interdependent. Um, we've put out a number of papers, done a number of events in the last year, some of which are outside. We'd, um, we'd encourage you to go ahead and pick those up. We'd also encourage you to visit our website, which is nextsocialcontract.org. Um, and uh, to look for and attend future events. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Gil Troy. He is a professor of history at McGill University in Montreal. 
He's also a newly visiting fellow with uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, D.C. He's written about the presidency from a number of different perspectives, um, including first ladies. He wrote a book uh, in 2006 called Hillary Rodham Clinton, Polarizing First Lady, which um, in looking at the reviews and the coverage of the book is universally recognized as a, as a fair, even-handed account of the Clinton presidency and of Mrs. Clinton's role as uh, America's first feminist first lady. He also wrote Morning in America, How Ronald Reagan Invented the 1980s, which is an interesting look at the Reagan legacy through a uh, pop culture perspective. He's written Mr. and Mrs. President, From the Trumans to the Clintons, about uh, relationships among uh, first families, and See How They Run, Changing Role of the Presidential Candidate. Uh, he is a native of Queens. He has a bachelor's, master's, and a doctorate from uh, that hotbed of moderation, Harvard University. And uh, please welcome the most fanatical moderate I know, Gil Troy. Thank you, Frank, not only for that kind introduction and for doing my job for me by <laughs> that's such a good summary, but um, to the New America Foundation for hosting and for really pushing the conversation about moderation, about centrism uh, forward. If we didn't have something like this and we didn't have the next social contract initiative, I think we have to invent it. So um, I'm really uh, very honored to be here. Um, I agree with what you said that it's, it's hard to be a moderate. Uh, just yesterday in the Washington Post, uh, Dana Milbank, the columnist, wasn't sure which uh, dance metaphor to use to mock McCain. It, the column was called, put your right wing in, take your left wing out. and. Uh, we read, while probable Democratic nominee Barack Obama follows the conventional path of sprinting to the center, McCain's route has had more turns than a Macarena. Slide to the right on judges and, and guns, jump to the left on climate change and foreign alliances, pivot to the right on taxes and Iraq. Um, I've spent uh, these last couple of days shamelessly shilling for this new book. I'm sorry, I misspoke. I've been trying to advance the historical conversation <laughs> about uh, moderation um, with my latest monograph. And uh, yesterday, I sat in my office and did a whole series of radio interviews uh, across the United States and um, got some very interesting reactions to this uh, centrist thing. Ah, you say you're, from, you're for centrist, for centrism, said a talk show host in Detroit. Do you think a true centrist would be willing to be an appeaser and talk to dictators who hate America? Wasn't quite sure which candidate he was talking about. <laughs> then when I spoke to somebody in Georgia, I'm trying to give political and geographical balance. Uh, he said, McCain may talk about centrism, but aren't all Republican policies about greed and selfishness? So um, no one wanted to kind of <coughs> hear the centrism uh, perspective. My two favorite comments were actually nonpartisan comments in defense of partisanship. Dimitri and Bob, right here in uh, Washington, D.C., introduced my WTOP interview last night by saying, if you want a word that sucks air out of the room, just say moderate. It's so boring, it gets people yawning. And uh, more crudely, one radio host said, uh, kind of channeling uh, Jim Hightower's book, if you hang out in the middle of the road, don't you just end up as roadkill? And we know that we're now at this moment, despite all the talk in the presidential campaign about the moderation of the candidates, that in general, in the last couple of years, um, we've been uh, at a moment in time where partisanship is the way to go. Partisanship is the way to get headlines. Partisanship is the way to sell books. Partisanship is the way to um, advance the conversation. A year ago, Connecticut Senator Joe Lieberman complained there's something profoundly wrong when opposition to the war in Iraq seems to inspire greater passion than opposition to Islamist extremism. And um, across the aisle, defending his scorched earth tactics Republican Congressman Tom DeLay, when he retired, said, you show me a nation without partisanship, and I'll show you a tyranny. It's not the principled partisan, however obnoxious he may seem to his opponents, who degrades our public debate. It's the preening, self-styled statesman who elevates compromise to first principle. And uh, here we are in one of the centers of preening, self-styled sta statesmanship. Um, elevating, not compromise though, and I appreciate that, it's not about compromise, um, but it's about trying to find that middle path, that golden way. So underlying this debate and these comments, two questions emerge. One, what's going on here in 2008? 
How are these candidates and why are these candidates racing for the center and what does that mean? Is it real? Is it just a posture? The second is, uh, what does it really mean to lead from the center? How can it be defined, assessed, understood historically and today? And we see my bookshelves are groaning with titles, some of which come from the New America Foundation. We have the vital center, the moral center, the radical center, the rational center, off center. And centrism sometimes risks being so apple pie, so generic a term, that just as when I talk to my students, I have to explain to them that when you say it's not constitutional, you actually have to prove that it has something to do with the Constitution, and it's not another way of saying it's bad um, or not democratic. And so too, centrism um, can't be just this generic term that uh, just gets us singing and feeling good about ourselves. And I don't dislike partisanship. In my book, I argue that parties, political parties, were one of the secrets to American success. And that without political parties, we wouldn't have had a functional system. And it was the founding fathers' mistake. Yes, the founding fathers occasionally made mistakes. It was their mistake not to include parties and to think that you could have the kind of democracy they wanted without parties. But there's partisanship, and then there's what uh, Ron Brownstein has called in his latest book, hyperpartisanship. And there's, there's a healthy dialogue between parties, and there's a pathological uh, discourse, which is what I fear has emerged recently in the United States. And I should say, you know, I'm a historian. Um, whenever I'm interviewed, um, the producer, uh, the radio show, the TV show, always asks me, you know, what do you think? Tell me historically. And then when the camera's rolling, the uh, anchor person inevitably asks the question, well, what's going to happen? And uh, I always say, you know, I'm a historian. It's hard enough for me to predict the past. I can't begin to predict the future. Proof of my inability to predict the past is I wrote this book uh, as kind of a lament, as uh, an expression of frustration that Americans had forgotten the middle path. And lo and behold, here we are in 2008 with two candidates talking about their race for the center. So I can't claim that I anticipated this moment, but now I want to say, well, the book is to explain this moment. And what's going on? We look, if we look at the candidates, um, we really see with both of them a kind of hologram. Depending on what perspective you uh, stand from, you see a different thing. Barack Obama debuted nationally in 2004, singing his remarkable song of centrism, his lyrical repudiation of those pundits who try to slice and dice America into the red versus the blue, the black versus the white. And that really launched his political career and brought him to the moment that he's now quite enjoying today. Less well known, but more interesting, I think, is in the audacity of hope, uh, Obama deviated from what had been kind of traditional leftist orthodoxy by acknowledging the power of culture to determine both individual success and social cohesion. He was talking about the importance of culture, the importance of, and, and, but then he added to that, having shifted a little bit to the right, shifted to the left, he added the importance of government having a role. He said, our government can play a role in shaping that culture for the better. And this tension about the role of culture, the role of government, um, I, I thought was really the heart of his centrism and, um, and, and rich in a very substantive way um, and, and showed the important roots to his more lyrical centrism. Although in, in my book I emphasize the importance of rhetorical leadership too. I think we have a tendency sometimes to dismiss that. And what we see in the modern world is that presidents succeed by learning how to speak to the people and being able to speak effectively. So we see that. We also see the analyses, the National Journal, uh, now famous analysis, that he's the most liberal uh, senator voting by, judging by his voting record. Uh, Americans for Democratic Action uh, give him a rating of 75 percent. His colleague from Illinois, Richard Durbin, gets a 95 percent rating, and John McCain gets a 10 percent rating, just to give him uh, a little bit of perspective there. Um, and unfortunately for Obama, Hillary Clinton's campaign was very effective in tagging him as the leader of black and blue America, rather than this red, white, and blue America that he'd been talking about. And um, I think what he needs to do during the general campaign is go back to 2004, go back to the start of 2008, and, and touch base with that yes, we can energy, and try to evoke that excitement um, of what I call this <coughs> lyrical centrism that he uh, articulated so well. 
And if he does that and he wins, then of course the challenge will be to take these lovely lyrical ideas and translate them into um, political reality, which is uh, much harder. But I think his analysis of the power of culture and the question of government is an interesting place to start. John McCain also can be seen from uh, two perspectives. On the one hand, he's, he hasn't been so much a lyrical centrist as what we could call a maverick centrist or an iconoclastic centrist, uh, most famous among non-Republicans, in some ways I guess among Republicans too, for deviating sometimes from party orthodoxy and being a little bit of the fly in the partisan ointment and that um, gave him uh, great credibility uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout this uh, early part of the century. And, um, but he also, unlike Obama, McCain um, partisans are quick to point out, in the Senate had a reputation and had a track record for bridge building. Uh, most famously with the, um, the gang of 14 who were trying to find some kind of middle path to get out of the partisan gridlock um, around judicial appointments. McCain's iconoclasm appeals to uh, independents disgusted by the polarizing partisanship reflected by MoveOn.org on the left um, and Fox News cheerleaders on the right and trying to push things to a new approach. McCain too, as we read in the Washington Post, is trying to figure out how that can square with a voting record, which, as you see, got a 10% from the Americans for Democratic Action. So uh, he too has to figure out just how he's going to play this role of the centrist. And, and I really think that right now, as the two nominees are pretty clear and they're starting, we're transitioning from the primary campaign to the general campaign, there's a struggle for their souls, I think particularly more on the Obama side, um, which way should they go? I know on the Democratic side of things, many in the liberal blogosphere are saying, we beat Hillary, we defeated Clintonism and centrism, let's stick to um, our liberal identity, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how things play out. Why this call for centrism today? I would suggest uh, three reasons. One is some presidential campaigns are about an attempt to extend the incumbent's tenure. In 1988, George H.W. Bush won uh, the presidency basically as Reagan's third term. You could argue that um, Harry Truman in 1948 was able to succeed and get uh, Franklin Roosevelt's fifth term. I think with both John McCain and Barack Obama, they're implicitly saying we're going to end the divisiveness that emerged during the Bush, Bush and Clinton years. We're going to try to um, turn over a new leaf. We're tired of seeing an electoral strategy like we saw in 2004 um, where uh, Matthew Dowd, the um, pollster for Bush, mocked the usual obsession. He said, oh, all we've heard for years is swing voters, swing voters, swing voters, swing voters, swing voters. That's not what we're playing for. We're playing for the base. So one, it is really an end to the Bush years, or promising an end to the Bush years. You never know what happens until <coughs> it happens. Two, I think there's a kind of generational phenomenon going on, all the talk about you know, Bush and Clinton. Uh, the baby boomers and their brand of politics are being repudiated, and Barack Obama spoke very eloquently about that prior to the campaign. He's talked less about that um, these days because baby boomers are an important voting demographic. You don't want to annoy them. Uh, but there, there is a certain sense of uh, John McCain as a pre-baby boomer, Barack Obama, who I'm happy to point out was born just three weeks after I was, so I really feel like I understand him very well. Um, and, uh, and, and people kind of count us as baby boomers, but we know that we're not the real baby boomers because we were um, still in elementary school when uh, all the excitement was going on. So we can't even lie and claim that we were at Woodstock um, <laughs> like the other 10 million people who claim they were there. And the third is uh, what I think is a return to an important American historical tradition, which is what I want to focus on now and, and, and leads to that second question of the meaning of moderation in American history. And I argue and believe strongly that the middle has been not just a very appealing but very American place to be. The great American center has a proud history of offering a kind of muscular moderation, not just a mushy middle. And this is a moderation rooted in principle tempered by pragmatism, 
rooted in nationalism, tempered by civility. It's the moderation of the American revolutionaries who didn't do a revolution like the Russians and French did, who wanted to strike a balance between the anarchy that sometimes results with um, revolutions, um, and on the other hand, they didn't want to replace one monarchy with another, and they came up with that middle path. It's the ethical balance of Ralph Waldo Emerson, who in his essay on politics in 1844 said, governments have their origin in the moral identity of men. Reason for one is seen to be reason for another and for every other. There's a middle measure which satisfies all parties, be they never so many or so resolute on their own. And Ralph Waldo Emerson, perhaps our greatest philosopher, talked about this middle path and he should be you know, your poster child um, in the New America Foundation. And it's the restrained partisanship of a much more practical philosopher, New York's mayor, Ed Koch, who said when he was running for governor, an unsuccessful campaign, we'll put that aside because it's a good line. He said, if you agree with me on nine out of 12 issues, vote for me. If you agree with me on 12 out of 12 issues, see a psychiatrist. And, and I, I think that's a, a, a wonderful introduction to our little tour of presidential history because I think there's a tendency sometimes, given that as a historian I'm writing against this tradition of the presidential superheroes, and usually it's been the Arthur Schlesinger, William Luckenberg, liberal presidential superheroes, to kind of have this simplistic equation where the president gets up, jumps into his superpower, superpower suit, solves all the problems, and everybody agrees. And we know that history is much messier than that, and it's much more complicated than that. And to start our little historical jaunt, I want us to think back to what I call the most significant dinner party in American history. It took place on, in June of 1790 in uh, 57 Maiden Lane, just near New York's Wall Street. And it was hosted by Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson had just come back from France, where he'd been uh, witnessing the revolution. He'd missed a lot of the constitutional debate. And he was there to play the role of broker. And he was trying to broker a deal between two people who'd worked so closely together to get the Constitution promulgated and accepted and ratified, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison. And now, a year into, less than a year into the George Washington administration, these two comrades were representing opposing forces. Alexander Hamilton envisioning an America that would be urban, that would be developed, that would be industrialized, wanted a government that used the elastic clause of the Constitution to expand power. James Madison, representing Virginia, <coughs> envisioned a country that would be rural, that if it was going to grow, wouldn't grow over time, but would grow over space and would stretch from sea to shining sea, but believed, as Thomas Jefferson believed, that you needed to have rural values in order to keep a democracy functioning. They were arguing about the location of the capital. Where should it be? Right now, of course, it was in New York, which is why they were meeting in New York. They were arguing about should the federal government take on revolutionary war debts that some states, like Virginia, James Madison's Virginia had paid, and that other states hadn't. And Thomas Jefferson, fresh off the boat, agrees to host them. He says, in general, I think it necessary to give as well as take in a government like ours. And the result of that lovely, elegant dinner, where I'm sure much Madeira was consumed, because that's what they did in those days, was a compromise. Washington, D.C., the city itself that all too often now represents partisanship and division, was the result of this compromise, as was a series of other compromise, the details of which are unimportant. But when you tell this story, there are two anomalies. One is that Thomas Jefferson would very soon become equally angry with Alexander Hamilton. And uh, as I say, fresh off the boat, he didn't yet know Hamilton well enough to loathe him. Um, so in the future, it would be much more about Alexander Hamilton versus Thomas Jefferson. Um, my former students, who I welcome, uh, know Jeffersonians and Hamiltonians. It's a constant obsession in American history. But even more important, the missing person in this whole discussion is George Washington. 
Why? Because unlike Thomas Jefferson, he didn't leave a diary that was very self-promoting, um, talking about how important his role was. But we can, by looking at evidence around, see that in many ways when Thomas Jefferson hosts this dinner and they talk through the issues and they work out a compromise, that this is Washington's way. Because again and again, George Washington was emphasizing the importance of compromise, the importance of the common cause, as he called it, of the middle way. George Washington would spend much of his time as president as the umpire, balancing out Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, trying to work through the passions of the new republic, and created a model of presidential leadership that wasn't about partisanship, but was about muscular moderation. And Washington would talk about liberal allowances, mutual forbearances, and temporizing yieldings on all sides. Beautiful, fancy 18th century language for saying, we've got to roll up our sleeves and compromise. We've got to agree. We've got to work together. And why? Because George Washington was a man of enlightenment. And he, steeped in the enlightenment, believed that every individual had reason, had been given reason by the deity. They didn't like to use the G word. And I'm a reasonable man. I come to a certain conclusion. You are a reasonable man. You may come to a different conclusion. And we can agree to disagree. And we can disagree without being disagreeable. And this is a lesson I think George Washington these days by historians is often underappreciated. He is considered to be this kind of mummified presence who f hovers over the brilliant titans of the early republic, Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. I think we have to return George Washington's voice, rediscover it, and see how important this vision of centrism was. We jump ahead to Abraham Lincoln. And of course, in the Disney version of Abraham Lincoln, uh, we see that he announces the Emancipation Proclamation. It's such a lyrical term. Uh, and the slaves are free. When we look at the Emancipation Proclamation, we see that it was actually a very limited state document with all the passion the great historian Richard Hofstetter says of an accountant's ledger. ledger. Why? Because the Emancipation Proclamation is written by a cautious politician named Abraham Lincoln who was not an abolitionist and who understands that, yes, there's this big fight between the North and the South, but there's also a huge fight between the border states in the North and the Northerners. And his job as president in order to win the Civil War is to keep the abolitionists just happy enough so that they don't start agitating too much, but keep those border states in line. And how do you do that? By talking about union and not about slavery. And the emphasis in the North is the fight for union. And Abraham Lincoln, with his humility, says, I claim not to have controlled events but confess plainly that events have controlled me. He is, allows other people to take sec center stage. And the Emancipation Proclamation is a limited document freeing states, free, freeing slaves in states that are still under the rebellion, and not all the slaves. It would take the 13th Amendment to the Constitution to, um, to do that. So Abraham Lincoln here, too, emerges with a different dimension. Washington gives us reason, enlightenment. Abraham Lincoln teaches us about pragmatism about knowing that as a politician, you may have certain goals. Abraham Lincoln found slavery disgusting. But he knew that in order to achieve that ultimate goal, he had to do it gradually. And he was a master of indirection. He was happy to appear ignorant when convenient. He loved to tell those folksy stories. So he would tell the story of the Irishman. And I apologize for the descent into ethnic humor, but that's what they did in the 19th century. So you would tell about the Irishman who had forsworn any liquor, but informed his bartender that whenever he orders a lemonade, he was allowed to add a little spot to the lemonade as long as it was unbeknownst to me. And Abraham Lincoln was very careful about his desire not to know everything that was going on and occasionally allow abolitionists to attack him, he would say, if it will advance our cause. Theodore Roosevelt comes in. And Theodore Roosevelt is perhaps one of my most unlikely moderates, because here was a guy who was so outsized as a personality. Father had to be a bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral, said his daughter. You can only imagine the issues in that family. <laughs> Woo! After an hour with him, you just had to wring his personality out of your clothes, one visitor to the Oval Office 
said. And why, though, does Theodore Roosevelt make it in my Mount Rushmore of moderates? Because Theodore Roosevelt, for all his bombastic, spasmodic, flamboyant approach to governing, at the end of the day, understood that if he was going to push America forward, he couldn't embrace the progressive movements and the populist movements which had been bu bubbling up whole hog. And he had to do it gradually. He had to set precedence. He had to go in baby steps. He understood when there was an anthracite coal strike in 1902 that he couldn't just let them fight it out. But he had to play the unlikely role of arbiter, of moderate. And in his autobiography, he says, it wasn't for the high office I held. I would have taken one of the critics who was giving him a hard time by the seat of the breeches and nape of the neck and chucked them out of that window. And he always had that kind of explosive personality, which I think helped him as an arbiter, because people were a little afraid of him. They never knew where he would go. But what Theodore Roosevelt really tapped into, and it's an, another element in our recipe for moderate leadership, was nationalism and America's vision of romantic nationalism. And he talked about being president of the plain people, and he talked about a vision of the American future that united people and that allowed them sometimes to put their differences aside. Theodore Roosevelt leads us to his protege, Franklin Roosevelt. And here, too, when I call Franklin Roosevelt a moderate, people say, Franklin Roosevelt, the liberal reformer, Franklin Roosevelt, the radical, how can you call him a moderate? To understand Franklin Roosevelt's moderation, we have to go back to 1932. We have to understand the conditions of the Great Depression, how serious the challenge was. And when Franklin Roosevelt was first elected, he received a letter from a fellow governor saying, Mr. President, he hadn't yet been inaugurated, but you know, people always like to butter people up. Mr. President, if your program succeeds, you'll be the greatest president in American history. If it fails, you'll be the worst one. Franklin Roosevelt replied, if it fails, I'll be the last one. And that reminds us of how delicate the situation was in 1932 and 1933, how worried people were about the future of the new republic. And Franklin Roosevelt's ability to come in and to preserve private property, make enough changes that, yes, annoyed the business class, annoyed his people, his class peers, but kept enough of that status quo while also being able to make enough change so that there was liberal progress but not a revolution is a testament to his great abilities. We see how Franklin Roosevelt overstepped in 1937 when he made one of the big mistakes of his tenure and he tried to pack the Supreme Court and he crossed that invisible line that Americans always draw around the Constitution by trying to add six justices to the Supreme Court so they would go in his favor. That was his, the big mistake of his reign and he learned from it and so during the big fight over World War II, about America's entry into World War II from 1939 to 1941. Isolationists are saying, we can't get involved in this fight. Interventionists are saying, we must. We see a model of presidential leadership by Franklin Roosevelt, not three steps ahead and not half a step behind, but half a step ahead, inching the people forward, understanding that if you articulate the four freedoms, if you articulate a rationale for the war, even before the war has started, if and when there is a war, there will be a rationale for it, and people will be able to rally around the flag as they did. So what we learn from Franklin Roosevelt is the power of incrementalism. And these presidents, these great heroes, then teach us reason, pragmatism, romantic nationalism, incrementalism, a kind of stew, a recipe for the muscular moderation that I think we need today. When we look at the three of the last four presidents, the last three two-term presidents, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush, we see variations on this theme, variations on this question of how do you lead and how do you find the center. Ronald Reagan comes in, of course, as a conservative, as the head of this conservative revolution. But Ronald Reagan succeeds because he understands that at the end of the day, the conservatives are going to stick with him. Who are they going to vote for? Ted Kennedy? Who are they going to vote for? Jimmy Carter? And he understands that his role is to play to the center. His role, while having certain core principles, is to reach out to the middle. 
And the conservative lament, let Reagan be Reagan, was an expression of conservative frustration, a reflection of the fact that when one White House ad, one, one, one White House aide was asked, what are the conservatives going to get? And the White House aide said, symbolism. That Reagan understood that he didn't have to worry about his right flank, he had to worry about the center. And I believe that when people said, let Reagan be Reagan, he actually was being Reagan. This was Reagan. Understanding that you had to have a lyrical center, understanding that you had to compromise sometimes, understanding that you had to show you had core values, but fundamentally you had to find that middle path as a muscular moderate. Bill Clinton, as has already been mentioned, comes in also talking about moderation. But my critique of him, and I'm not necessarily endorsing Reagan's policies or Clinton's policies, I'm talking about their tactics. My critique of Bill Clinton is that he was a spineless centrist. That in many ways he gave centrism a bad name with his triangulation, with his constant polling about where he stood. And at the end of the day, the only time he showed his tremendous skill set politically, and the only time he really went to the mat was to hold on to power during the Monica Lewinsky episode. And had he used that same skill set, had he applied it to advance health care reform, or as he talked about at the beginning of the second term, a race relations initiative, he might have gone down as someone who fulfilled his potential. Instead, he goes down as the woulda, coulda, shoulda kid. And I have to say that as I was writing my chapter on Bill Clinton, I was well aware of the fact that um, this would potentially annoy many Democrats. I think the defeat of Hillary Clinton and the rise of Obama has made the critique of uh, Bill Clinton sort of more acceptable. But I didn't, wa I didn't want that. I actually wanted to stir some trouble. And finally, my uh, chapter on George W. Bush, I, I call him imprisoned by conviction. Because while true, after September 11th, um, for a few weeks, especially in the buildup to the Afghanistan war, he showed a remarkable example of presidential leadership, of how to move the nation together, how to keep the nation united, how to go to something which, and you, it's, it's remarkable, you go back and read uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times from October 2001 and um, November. And people are saying, wow, it's amazing. He's got such a brilliant team of Condoleezza Rice and Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney. They're saying, wow, look at the leadership that he exerted. There's one article in the New York Times where they interview a whole bunch of Al Gore advisors uh, all of whom are off the record, and only one of them says that they wished Al Gore was in office. They all said that uh, George W. Bush was doing a better job. So there is that moment of unity, but, but, uh, but he himself, Bush himself decides that he'd rather stand by his convictions and I think fails to make the sale on many of his future policies, especially in the second term. I want to end with going in two different directions and open up for questions. One is um, I, I want to suggest, in addition to this recipe for muscular moderation, I, I want to um, point out some of the conclusions that this focus on moderation emphasizes. One, I, I thought I was writing a book about moderation, about centrism. I actually ended up writing a book about American nationalism. And I think nationalism has become a dirty word among too many, certainly, of my uh, professorial peers. And uh, it's, a, it's a mistake to forget the importance of American nationalism and how true centrism is built on a love of the country. True, cent true centrism is built on uniting Americans to work together and figuring out how to do that, not in an apple pie sort of way, but in a very uh, substantive sort of way. Secondly. Consensus has become a bad word these days. I want to bring back the idea of consensus and the importance of consensus. And I think that my generation of historians has failed. They've succeeded in teaching where America has gone wrong. We know more than we certainly did in previous generations of American sexism and racism and class conflict. But to just talk about America as a series of divisions, as a series of problems, as a series of failures, is to miss what we really need to spend time talking about, which is how America succeeds. And my generation of historians has not done that for political reasons, and we need to start having that conversation about why America works, and what's the glue that keeps this nation of 300 million together, and what's the lure that keeps people trying to come to this country. Third is the 
sobering conclusion and the sobering challenge, I just um, saw the movie Sex in the City. I had to go with my wife. Um, <laughs> I was leaving for a week and a half to shill, and you know, what could I do? And, uh, and the, the, the climax of the movie has one of the uh, characters, Samantha Jones, saying, I've had a 50-year relationship with one special person myself, and I want to continue that. And this is after that dizzying round of costume changes and brand names and, and all this thing. And, you know, and it, it skirts on parody. But at the end of the day, <laughs> it's hard not to kind of leave that going, wow, how come I can't have that life? And what that shows to me is one of the things we really have to deal with, which neither of the presidential candidates has the nerve to deal with, uh, certainly uh, now, is the, the challenge of modern American materialism and selfishness and indulgence. It's very hard to be a temperate leader. It's very hard to have constraints as a leader. It's very hard to strike a balance when we have this media environment, when we have this materialistic environment, when we have this family-oriented environment, which is much more about the me, the I, the more, the now, than the us, the right thing to do, the right path. And I, I ask the question, is political moderation possible? in an age of excess. So those are some of the bigger conclusions. I want to end with just one um, way I'm thinking about how do we solve this problem of how do you get passionate centrists pushing for the center? Because right now, what I believe is going on um, is we see uh, McCain being pulled to the right by many of um, Republican Party activists. We see Barack Obama being pulled to the left. And that's what usually happens. And there's nobody in the middle to push. Let's take an example from today's headlines. John McCain was asked about uh, his reaction to the um, Supreme Court decision about the uh, detainees at Guantanamo Bay. And he said, it obviously concerns me. The New York Times report says he, uh, he, said, he, he said it at a campaign stop before he had a chance to read the decision. So what happens? Concerned? Concerned? Asks a blog post on National Review Online. And that, that, that's considered to be too tepid a reaction. And that leads to this narrative of John McCain as not playing to the base and not having uh, strong support in the Republican Party. And lo and behold, that evening, McCain absorbs the details of the decision. And by the next day, a pugnacious McCain was calling the ruling one of the worst decisions in the history of this country. Now, I'm not debating the rights and the wrongs of McCain's decision. I want McCain to get positive reinforcement for saying, I'm concerned, but I'm going to think about it. I want there to be a push from the center to say, it's good, especially in the era of 24-7 news, for a candidate to take a breath. Maybe I'm particularly sensitive to this, because I was on CTV news during the um, decision that, remember there was this minor issue in 2000 between George Bush and Al Gore, and the Supreme Court came out with a decision? And the CNN reporter is reading, the, like flipping through, it was a 55 page decision. He's flipping through, you know, picking out sentences. And we're watching that in the CTV studio. And then, of course, the anchor says, and Gil, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And like, how, how can I analyze a decision which not only have I not read, but this guy is just sort of picking out highlights from? So I said, sometimes in the life of a democracy, we just have to let the ship of state go forward and listen to the silence. Listen to the sounds of silence. Enjoy the fact that there's no revolution. Enjoy the fact that there's no tanks on the streets. And let's see what happens. That was my indirect. I didn't know what else to say. We don't appreciate silence. We don't appreciate patience sometimes. So wouldn't it be great, this is my new idea for the day, if we had a moderometer, if we had a blog that balanced candidate statements. And when a candidate pushed to the right, it would go this way. When he pushed to the left, it would go that way. But when he said something like, I'm concerned, I want to think about this, he got props for staying in the middle. Similarly, look at the whole fight over uh, th this uh, comment that Obama made with Jake Tapper um, about uh, cracking down on terrorists, but also defending the Constitution. When we, take, when we see candidates taking that and calling it as pre-September 10th, we can push one way. When um, Barack Obama comes back and tries to come out with a balanced statement talking about fighting terror, and also defending the Constitution, we can give him positive reinforcement for striking a balance. When he talks about the constraints of the Constitution and uses the Constitution in a sort of negative way, we can say, you know, maybe you want to use slightly different language. And we, as moderates, need to figure out a way to push back. That is my 
hope that is my challenge. It is very easy to get whipped up into a partisan frenzy. It's much harder to take a breath. It's much harder to look for the middle path. It's much harder to be a muscular moderate than a hysterical hyperpartisan leader. But we need to make demands and we need to find people who are going to do this and during this campaign especially I think there's really a moment where we can say this is what we want and in doing it you're not deviating from American history but you're actually fulfilling America's highest ideals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gail. Uh, as you can see, a truly passionate moderate um, and I think uh, we, those of us who are working on these issues from the center and uh, the nation as a whole need, need more Giltroys in the discussion. Uh, we'll start with some Q&A. Um, I will start, but when, when we get to audience questions, um, I'll repeat your uh, question just for the sake of the cameras. Um, if you could uh, stand and, uh, and let us know where you're from as well, that would be helpful. Um, Gil, in trying to find a sort of common thread among these successful moderates, uh, as you lay, the, lay out their administrations, it seems to me they had uh, strong and divergent cabinets, several of them, Washington certainly, uh, based on the nature of, of the dinner that you spoke about, but uh, Lincoln had some, some firebrand uh, uh, abolitionists, of which he was not one, as you mentioned. Um, even FDR had some who were pulling him a lot further left than uh, he was necessarily inclined to go. Uh, and maybe even Reagan um, in some cases. Do you see that common thread and do you see the lack of that sort of strong divergent cabinet uh, as a thread in the uh, failed presidencies that you touch on or others? Uh, thank you. It's a, it's a great question. There's a second book to be written about the dynamics in the White House between the president um, and his advisors. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, if you're talking about muscular moderation, you're talking about what makes a leader strong. And um, one of the problems with being president, one of the problems that occurs in the campaign is you get, you're in this bubble. And it's very easy, especially I think in the modern era, to be constantly surrounded by yes men. Um, uh, now we should say yes people. Uh, but th as a result, you don't get the, the feedback that you need. And also, if you're not brokering between two extremes in your official family, you sometimes forget the need to reach out to the, the rest of the nation. And, and I think that's really the, the, the question here. That the, it's, it's too simplistic to just dream about everybody agreeing. And that's why, at the end of the day, I accept parties, and I accept partisanship, and I, accept, and I, and I, and I accept passion. The, the question is, how do you work through the disagreements? And um, if you're able to bring enough of it into your official family, then it works. Now, one thing in, f in, in fairness to the presidents is that up until the Reagan administration, really, you could assume that if you had a cabinet, um, if you had an official family, whatever disagreements that occurred would pretty much stay within that official family. What is difficult for presidents today, and we also see it in campaigns, is not only the constant leaking to the press, and not only the gamesmanship that has occurred, but you know, going back to Ronald Reagan, David Stockman, Don Regan, the fact that you feel that often when you're even sitting around the table with your most intimate advisors, they're you know, typing on, I guess now on their Blackberries, um, and, and keeping notes for the tell-all book. How can you be a muscular moderate? How can you be uh, an intelligent leader? in that kind of jaundiced environment. How can, you know, it's, it's hard enough to be in this 24-7 news environment where people are constantly monitoring you outside. But if there's no privacy, if there's no space even inside the White House, thank you, Scott McClellan, then what do you do? Great, great. All right, questions, anyone? Yes, sir. Uh, Michelle Atomans from a Canadian TV network. Uh, welcome to DC, Professor Troy. Nice to see you here. Nice to see you. And, uh, in Montreal. Uh, uh, as a, as a journalist uh, on a daily basis, uh, we also, uh, before getting into uh, power, uh, people have to be elected, and we um, noticed that uh, um, like a, a strong uh, partisan and media people um, attract a lot of listeners and viewers. They are extremely popular, I believe far more popular than somebody who would adopt a moderate position. How can you how can you explain that, that is no, it's not easy to, uh, 
it, how can you explain this succeeds so well? It's, it's an excellent question. It's, it's a major problem. In, in my conclusion, I talk not just about sex in the city, because I hadn't seen the movie yet, but, um, but I talk about this problem of culture, right? We live in the age of Rush Limbaugh. We live in the age of Al Franken. Right, where Al Franken not only uh, you know, has, has created a career um, as a comedian going into political commentary, but now he's going from political commentary into potentially the Senate. And you're right, the American people, and this is, you know, we've always had this kind of schizophrenia as Americans. On the one hand, when we put on our Sunday suits, we, we talk a lovely game and we read editorials about how we need to have a politics that's lovely and centrist and reasonable. But who makes the money off of us? Who gets our blood boiling? How, campaigners know that if you really need to kill somebody, you need a, camp, you need a negative campaign commercial. You don't need some beautiful apple pie, apple pie speech. Similarly, we see in, in culture that the, the superstars of today are the Ann Coulters and the Rush Limbaugh's of the world. So what do you do? And that's why I think you know, I was talking before about this moderometer, which is to push politicians. I think we also need to have a conversation among the American people about what do you want. And if you are constantly feeding this kind of vulgarity, and you bring it into your homes, and you're, and, and you're making these people into superstars, how do we expect anything better? Uh, you know, there's a sort of false nostalgia for the 1950s. And there's a real nostalgia for the 1950s. The false nostalgia of the 1950s reduces everything to Leave it to Beaver episodes and says it was a simple time there and, and misses the racism, the sexism, and the ugliness that occurred in the 1950s. But we have to be careful, at the risk of using a cliche, not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. During the 1950s, there was a certain sense of a social consensus. There were certain guidelines. There was a certain sense of we're not going to just allow the most vulgar or most shrill or angriest person to become a media superstar. And the only answer to that is not censorship. And uh, it's not somebody from on high coming and micromanaging it. It's triggering a revolution in our churches, in our schools, in our families, um, and, and saying we can't accept this. Now, beyond being a passionate monitor, <clears throat> you are a prolific blogger. You have uh, four, I believe, um, that I've found uh, in the course of, of looking into your work. How do blogs play into that? And is there any way to harness the positive side of blogs for, uh, to promote a muscular moderation. There's a, a great book that came out last year called Wikonomics, and it takes the Wikipedia model of grassroots thought and co collective cooperation and says, just as they put together this encyclopedia, which is quite extraordinary, which can match Encyclopedia Britannica, they go into various areas, um, such as uh, economics, um, showing different corporations that have taken that same Wikipedia idea of don't hold on to information, but spread it to the people. Don't sit on the 20,000 bits of information you have having gold mine, uh, ha ha trying to find gold mines, but put it on the internet and use the power of the internet to, um, to, to turn things around. And, and this guy is a kind of evangelist about the, the, the Web 2.0 and how it can survive and how it can really change things. One of the things that was so sobering to me when I read this was that he didn't talk about politics. He didn't talk about how the Wikipedia model was going to save politics because my lament in the book is that in general the blogosphere has not brought us to the middle but has instead brought us to the extremes. That the blogosphere, and, and we saw it in that McCain example, because what happens, the bloggers go and they push to the right or to the left. The mainstream media quotes them because they're so darn colorful. And then all of a sudden we have in the New York Times the narrative of the McCain campaign trying to, um, you know, risking losing the base. So, um, I am, and then it's funny, you know, every now and then I, I, I come onto some website or you read uh, the works of Joe Trippi, um, and, uh, who was the, the genius behind the uh, Howard Dean campaign, remember him and remember that. Um, and, and they talk with such idealism about this, and it's usually on, on the left, the, this progressive community that's emerging from the bloggers, I don't see it. Um, so uh, I think what we need to do is, is push back, and part of it is creating our own blogs. Um, my, my experience with blogging, I'm, I'm, I'm very much a newbie, and um, I, I still use it kind of as like a way of posting op-eds rather than actually really blogging. Um, and and I've, I've, I've been working with, with a friend of mine who's trying to coach me to become, he calls it being a good citizen of the blogosphere. <laughs> now, what was interesting about being a good, you know, I hear good citizen of the blogosphere, I'm ready to sing glory, glory, hallelujah. I assume <laughs> it's going to be all about, you know, responsibility. And, and No, what does a good citizen of the blogosphere mean? A good citizen of the blogosphere means 
mixing it up, being a part of it, and linking your blog to somebody else's blog. My, my blogs are very boring because they're not linked up. <laughs> so uh, hopefully in the next uh, couple months I'll be linking, um, and everybody's going to be turning onto this moderometer, um, <laughs> which I should say I, I have to run by my students and my kids to make sure it's not an embarrassing, goofy title before I actually use it. <laughs> and trademark it. Right. As <laughs> yes? Shira Goldberg. I was a student in Professor Choi's U.S. History course my first year of college. Bill, you mentioned at the beginning of your remarks that there's a difference between moderation and compromise. How do you distinguish between the two? Excellent question. Um, and and this, this gets to this notion of muscular moderation, that part of it is compromising. Uh, part of it is knowing when to cut the deal. You look at someone like Ronald Reagan, and uh, he, it's a very interesting example because uh, on the one hand, what do we know about Ronald Reagan? We know Ronald Reagan hated taxes. Um, we know that he always wanted to cut taxes. We also know that he enhanced revenue um, in the most dramatic and historic way uh, two years into his term. Why? Because he needed to. And there's an interesting exchange you can see in the, in the Reagan Library where he's constantly talking about revenue enhancements uh, in public. But when he sits and talks to congressmen like Jack Kemp, who are furious, Republican congressman who's been pushing to shrink government for a long time, he knows he can't get away with using that language. And his, his advisors say, you know, you, you'll lose him if you, if, if you try to oversell it. Uh, so sometimes you need to compromise. But part of it also is, and this is where, you know, the excitement of this lyrical centrism that I've talked about, about Barack Obama, um, is that the, uh, the romantic nationalism of, of, of the Theodore Roosevelt. Part of it is, is leadership. Part of it is being able to communicate. You know, Ronald Reagan, the great commuter, was, communicator, was able to, uh, and, and we have public opinion polls showing this, that people disagreed with his policies but still liked the guy. And they disagreed with his policies, but they still th thought this speech was successful and that speech was successful. Um, my Canadian friends could never understand it because it's a very different uh, rhetorical um, tone set in Canada. But the way kind of Americans go, ah, oh, when he spoke, that sort of that, that, that warmth. So you don't necessarily have to compromise all the time. You have to compromise sometimes, but you also have to have uh, a vision of leadership. Yes. I'm Barbara Weinstein, another former student. Um, combine See How They Run with this thesis. How does the structure of the modern campaign prevent people who are true moderates from ever getting to the Oval Office at all? Uh, thank you. I, I like that. I feel like I'm, after all these years of asking them creative final, final <laughs> questions, and now they're uh, <laughs> getting their come up, I'm getting my comeuppance. Um, in, in See How They Ran, it's actually interesting that, that you mention this, because there's also a kind of contradiction between See How They Ran and Leading from the Center. Um, first, your, your question. The, what we see, and, and, and we're seeing it in these, in this, these last couple of weeks, and it goes a little bit to Richard's question too, that the problem is, is that the structure of the campaign doesn't necessarily go toward the middle, it goes toward the extremes, right? Um, you want to get headlines, you want to get excitement, you want to, um, you want to get money. Right? One of the things we, we really have to talk about is the role of money in the campaign and fundraising. Who's going to write the check? Right? And again, one of the interesting things about the Barack Obama campaign is that the checks have been you know, $18, $25, $50, not always you know, in, in the hundreds and thousands of dollars um, as a model of internet-based um, fundraising. But even so, that's from, that's from passionate people. And so when you're trying to solidify your base, you're trying to capture media attention, you're trying to raise money, how do you do that while also being nice and centrist? It's very difficult. So the, the story of the presidential campaign and the story uh, which See How They Ran tells of the development of the presidential candidate from being passive and standing in uh, repose, Republican repose, awaiting the people's call as George Washington did on his farm, as many candidates did throughout the 19th century, as opposed to now this hyperactive marathon. Um, we see the more active you are, the harder it is to have that kind of model of constrained leadership. But the potential that you have comes from one of the things that I think are most valuable about the modern campaign is that it's basically, it's basic training and a re dress rehearsal for your ability to speak to the American people. And that's where you can sometimes speak over the forces that are pushing to the right and to the left and create this golden mean, this, this important center. Um, now, just to, to emphasize the contradiction, in um, See How They Ran, one of the, the things I emphasize is that mudslinging is an old and valued American tradition. And, the, um, and, and I, you know, there are great quotes going back to Jefferson fighting Adams um, about, uh, about this. And so there was, you know, perhaps the world-weary graduate student, um, it was my dissertation, uh, basically saying, you know, 
we think that things are, are bad um, now, and we think there's some kind of golden age, but you know, there's always been trouble uh, now in um, <coughs> middle age, I hate to use that phrase, uh, maybe I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit more hopeful and say, yes, there always has been mudslinging, I don't deny that, and I don't, again, I don't want to give a kind of um, G-rated version of American history where everything is, is all Bambi, um, but I, I do want to, while acknowledging the tensions, acknowledging the differences, acknowledging the passions, acknowledging that there was a civil war, also try to push us to a, um, a higher plane like the New America Foundation is doing. Thank you. Thanks for the plug. Sure. Yes, sir. You invited me, at least I can do yes. that. <laughs> Say it every 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm uh, Michael Usdan, and I'm not a former <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. Uh, I'd like to ask you to amplify your reactions to Bill Clinton, because in many people's minds, apart from the personal issues he got into, Essentially, he did kind of reach the middle, at least symbolically. He had this ability to communicate. He had this ability of uh, the only Democrat to earn two terms. And uh, your description of a failed presidency, we'll never know if he didn't get into the personal kind of mm -hmm. issues, what he might have accomplished or might not have accomplished in the second term. But I just wondered if you would just amplify your reactions to him, because in many people's mind, he was this kind of centrist moderate. And I gather you don't think there were very many concrete accomplishments. That the potential was there, but the potential was unrealized. Thank you for that question. And I should use it as an opportunity to uh, apologize for the way I ran through every one of the um, uh, presidents and uh, urge you to read the book because there's a full chapter on each one. Um, and I structured the book in a way of kind of telling the stories of the presidents because I think that's what we need to do in order to understand them. Um, so in the Clinton chapter, I obviously, you know, talk about this and you know he's he's the one who comes in to a Reaganized America and he's able to push the Democratic Party um, away from the from being held hostage to the special interests he's able to talk about uh, you know the, the man who said the era of big government is over is not Ronald Reagan not George W Bush but Bill Clinton um, he talks about a third way and he should be I, I think the way I the way I start the chapter is that you know Bill Clinton should be the hero of this book he should be the model moderate um, he was the one who who had that brilliant political ear and that ability to speak to the American people. But at the end of the day, what did him in, and, and when, I, when I talk about the Monica Lewinsky episode, I'm not talking about whatever he did in his private time. I'm talking about the fact that you look at his two major initiatives, as I mentioned in my talk, health care reform. Um, and, the, the, and, you know, it's funny, you go back to, we completely forgot this, but in January 2008, um, I'm sorry, in January 1997, when um, Bill Clinton is coming into his second term, he pulls together a commission, and he gives them a year to come out with a, a vision of race relations. And here you have someone, and my disappointment with Bill Clinton comes from the, the great potential that he had and the great hopes that he unleashed. So here you have someone who had, prior to this campaign, the great ability to speak to African Americans. And you had someone who had tremendous credibility both with the white community and the black community. And he says, let's put this on the table. Let's talk about this. And he has a commission. Um, the great uh, African-American historian John Hope Franklin is one of the people on the commission. And they come out with a really interesting report in January, not 1997, but 1998. And they talk about how we need to push the conversation in America away from what they're called racialism to a, a new center. That report is buried in the headlines that emerge over the Monica Lewinsky episode. So here, this moment of tremendous potential absolutely frittered away. And then, to make it even worse, you see during the year that, um, that he's fighting to keep his job, how frequently his political obituary is written, and how again and again just pulls out of, out of his sleeve just tremendous skills. Had he used those skills for, to advance race relations, had he used those skills for health care reform, um, some people think we might have had a disaster on our hands, some think people might have had salvation, but he would have had a, a much more of a track record. Instead, he relied on the band-aids of V-chips and things like that, which are not really the, the, the province of the president anyway. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the Clinton chapter. Um, I'm Diane Perlman. I'm a clinical and political psychologist and registered independent. Um, and my question is about maybe a somewhat different way that I frame what you're talking about, the third way, which is actually a third dimension, which is off the right-left axis, which is still, like moderation, you're still, you know, two dimensions mm -hmm. in the center. And I think that the, like, whatever you think, it has to be framed as, like, if you're against the war, then that makes you left, or if you believe in this, it, and that means that people who identify as right can't even think about what you're talking. And as a social scientist, also connected with the whole field of conflict analysis, conflict studies, 
that um, there's a way of thinking like what what reduces tension? How do you reduce you know understanding dynamics and thinking about well this, this might be another aspect of pragmatism? You know what will really make us safer? And there's a lot that we're gripped by fear, emotion, beliefs that stop blocks us from thinking. Um, so I think maybe the, the third way or centrism still means you're in the middle of right and left rather than say post-partisan as opposed to bipartisan or asking questions where you don't have to identify as right or left but if we do this this will increase our security this will make a, this is a sound policy this will work better because we've analyzed it through social science so. no I, I appreciate that analysis um, you know there's always the book that you write um, the the book that you publish, and the difference between the book that you write and the book that you publish is the 200 pages that you had to cut in order to make your editor happy. Um, and in the book that I wrote, as opposed to the book that I eventually published, I, I spent more time trying to think through some of these issues and some of the issues that the New America Foundation, that I mentioned it again, um, <laughs> no, but this is a sincere one, was, uh, <laughs> no, no, sorry, that uh, what was doing it, I, I felt that part of, you know, what I kind of needed to do, having given this wrong through history is, you know, talk about how do we, how do we find a third way? How do we, how do we think through some of the issues? Um, so I, I appreciate your raising this question, and, and, I, and I like your, your notion of, of a different dimension. Uh, let's take something like the war on terror. And again, the, the exchange that uh, Barack Obama had first with Jake Tapper of ABC News, um, I think, two days ago, um, and, uh, and now the, the way it's being played out um, in, in, in the media and between the McCain campaign and the Obama campaign is a very interesting example of this. Um, and it goes to the Joe Lieberman quote that I had. I don't think there's anybody who is a, you know, who's in American politics today who's pro-terror, right? I think we all agree that terror is bad, right? And we all agree that 9-11, um, that and it's funny, in, in my book, I talk about 9-11 and the unit that emerged from 9-11. And in writing about it, I looked for other historians who had written about this. This is already six or seven years ago. Historians haven't yet touched the subject. Um, many um, history books sort of end in 2000, 2001, uh, and, and I think it raises interesting questions about American nationalism, it, about American community that, uh, again, my generation of historians doesn't like, doesn't like to touch, so they kind of pull away from. Um, so we start with our, our abhorrence with terror. And what happens all too often in the back and forth um, of left and right, of Democrat and not, we, 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 we forget about that. Uh, at least, you know, Democrats forget to emphasize how important that is. If you go through even Barack Obama's recent statements um, about the about uh, how to how to um, preserve the Constitution, he tends to have more lines and more words about the Constitution and fewer words about how much he hates terror. That's a mistake. I don't doubt in any way, shape, or form that Barack Obama finds terrorism as disgusting as I do. But it's important, given the journalist political environment in which he operates, to emphasize that more. So one of the things I would do if I was a Barack Obama advisor, and this I think goes to the dimension, is I would challenge Barack Obama to give a speech about what George Bush did right on the war of terror, against terror. Because the conversation has been about all where George, the conversation from the left has been all about where George W. Bush went wrong, and there's certainly things to learn from. But I think one of the things that the Barack Obama campaign, and it also ties into Michelle Obama's remarks, has to focus on is not just a campaign about what's wrong with America, but a campaign that's what's right with America. And that was, again, the beauty of his 2004 speech that's been somewhat lost in the din in the last couple of uh, months. And that would be a kind of sister soldier moment where he acknowledges the strengths of the administration without endorsing George W. Bush, without endorsing John McCain, but saying, this is how we kind of get to this third dimension. Now, I'm sure that's not the direction you wanted me to go in, but, um, but what, what, I'm, what I'm hearing from you, or at least what I'm trying to, to say, is we need to have some kind of way of having conversations where we focus on where we agree and then focus on where we disagree. It's a matter of, think of the battlefield. The ch ch challenge in the presidential campaign, this goes to Barbara's question and Richard's also, is we're always widening the field of battle. We're always trying to show all the ways in which the candidates disagree. Maybe the smart thing for the centrists to do is to narrow the battlefield. And this, I think, was one of the tensions in the Hillary Clinton-Barack Obama fight. We agree on A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But on X, Y, and Z, Z for the Canadians, um, we, this is where we fundamentally disagree. And I think that that's a strategy that may not play um, in the media, but might play in Peoria. Right. Well, just, I, I don't want to take more time, but sure. just quickly. There's a whole other um, way of understanding. We deal with the symptom of terrorism on the supply side, not the demand side. So there's a whole dimension that's missing on 
reducing desire of people to take revenge on us, reducing the causes. And that's absent. Everyone's on the symptom side, which allows the other to escalate. So we're provoking escalation and then trying harder to stop it. So, so but wouldn't, wouldn't that be a great speech? Start with the supply side and what Bush has done right. Because there has, thankfully, been no terror attack since 9-11. That's probably, you know, Bush's greatest accomplishment has been a negative accomplishment, right? But so you start with that. You start with the changes in the Treasury Administration, all kinds of things that were done right on September 12th and forward. You get the headline about, you know, Barack Obama endorses. And then you get to your point uh, and Barack Obama's broader symbolic value um, in terms of being able to fight the war of terror in a different dimension, you've got a good speech there and you've created a centrist speech, not just the simple left-right. Great. One last question, real quick, please. Charlton uh, Bethesda, man, you talk about that the left and right pull the candidate to the extreme and also the voice of moderation is silent. But I think uh, the media can play a, a role uh, to modernize the, the candidate through their question and also give them a chance to talk to American people. And in this way, the candidate cannot be too extreme and he got to move to the center. I, I think you're raising a very important question about the role of the media. And to what extent does the media act as a centrist force and to what extent does it act as a divisive force? And the true answer would be yes, it does both. Um, if you speak to people from the extremes, especially people from the left, they will talk about the degree to which the mainstream media, um, and bloggers often talk about this, how the mainstream media simply perpetuates the status quo. There's a lot of anger on the part of the left that you know, George Bush was able to stay in power for so long um, and get reelected because there was just this kind of you know, uh, echo chamber uh, in the media. On the other hand, you have a lot of people who look and see the degree to which, as uh, Frank said in his introduction, the, the degree to which everything gets divided to, you, know, you have a room for the pro and you have a room for the con. I've recently been watching Fox News it's, a, it's hard on the soul. Um, not because of where they state politically, but because every single conversation is going to be left-right. When you're, you know, during the uh, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton primary, it's going to be pro-Barack, it's going to be um, pro-Hillary, but there's not going to be an analysis. There's no room for analysis. And um, this isn't just an endorsement for the needs of talking heads to, to get more airtime, but we need people in the media who are asking questions that don't just go to the left and right, and we need voices that play to that center. So the media has, has a, a d double function there. It's uh, another book, it right. sounds like. Uh, <laughs> well, I want to thank Professor Troy. I want to thank all of you for coming. The professor will be signing books uh, outside if you'd like to do that. And uh, again, thanks for coming, and we hope to see you again soon.